wonderful tribute to God, isn't it? Yeah, to the one who has rescued my soul. How I many of you feel that way, that God has rescued your soul? <laughs> yeah, that matters, right? Yeah, yeah it sure does. Uh, that to recognize the fact that my soul was lost and floundering and uh, helpless and hopeless and drifting and out there in, in a sea of options, and Christ rescued me. Yes, he did. And for you to know that and to, and to accept that is a tremendous uh, part of your life and part of what God says is really important for us to do, and, and, thus, and thus the book of James <laughs> comes in because of everything that God has, uh, has said in our life. We, uh, most of you know and are familiar with where we, what we've been studying in the book of James. I was sharing with the, again with the group that was here early before, you know, the cameras came on and other things like that happened. And, um, and I was sharing with them or, or asking them about the thought of uh, what we've been so far in the book of James, and I hope it's not becoming, like, uh, redundant to you or too familiar so that you kind of have a dis- kind of a, a distance between you and what's being said. Oh, I know that. I've heard that. Uh, move on. Let's get to something new. And all of that kind of stuff, because that's one of the things that, that hinder us and, and keep us, I think, immature in life, is we never really uh, live in some of this Word of God so that it attaches to us, that it engrafts itself into us and matters and makes a difference, because James teaches us, and I will look at the scripture in just a moment, that's just about where we'll be starting with the 16th verse of chapter 1, and then we'll go through all of chapter 2 today, prayerfully, (laughs) respectfully, Lord, you know, I'm praying, Lord, come on, let's go, let's go at least through that today, and uh, it basically says that that the word of God engrafts itself to me, and the part that engrafts to me has the ability to change my life. And that's really true. It, it, you have something that's, that's taken itself and, 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 and planted itself in your life. That's what makes a difference when you get in trials and, yeah. and yeah. issues of life. It helps you endure. It's not just the Word, because if you don't remember it, if it hadn't burned its place into your life and it hadn't engrafted itself to you so that when things happen, this word pops out and, and, and gives you strength and gives you an encouragement or maybe helps you walk through some tough times, then uh, it's, not, it's not all the word that's spoken. It's the word that, that's, in, that's hooked to you, the words that the Holy Spirit has grafted inside of you that takes you through these times. And so James says it's powerful, and, and he, he really has a tremendous respect for what God does through his Holy Spirit with the Word of God. He calls it the Word of Truth, which it is. It's God speaking to us because God tells us the truth, and we don't know what truth is until God speaks it, you know. Right, right. right really? I mean, you're, 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 the incidences that you have in life, the conditions that you're walking through, if I ask you what, where you were or what does that mean or... Are you going to make it and give you some questions like that? You might speak out of a human heart and a human thought. Well, here's the truth about my situation, or here's the truth about where I am in life, or here's the truth about where I'm going, but that's your truth. We don't know the real truth until God says something about it because whatever God says something about is the real truth. The widow was on her way to bury her husband, and bury, well, she had buried her husband, and now she was on the way to bury her son, and Jesus came alongside, and knowing what had happened, and, and, and he spoke to her, and she said, uh, well, I've buried my husband, and this is my son, and that's what my perspective, that's my truth, and Jesus says, no, your son is not dead, he's alive, and he resurrected him right there on the spot, so what was the truth? The truth wasn't what she said, the truth was what Jesus said. And I'm just saying to you that, that, that the issues of your life are not over until God says something about it because that's the truth, and you don't discover truth. Truth is revealed to you. God gives you truth when you need truth. When James says when you're in these issues of life, in these trials of life, 
these multi-shaded pirates find their way into your life. These various trials is how James describes it. When those things happen, you ask God for wisdom. Wisdom about what? Wisdom about why this is happening. Wisdom about how do I respond. Wisdom about what, what, what does this mean to me? Lord, give me a perspective. Give me a, give me a heart. Give me a passion. Give me encouragement. Help me walk through this stuff. That's what, ask him, ask him about those things. And, and James says, and he'll give it to you. He'll help you walk through these things. God's, God's nature is to give. It's not to withhold. I mean, no matter what the world tells us, the world tells us, you know, that God is a cosmic ogre up there that's looking to put hard conditions on us, that God's lifeless, that he's, he's distant, that he doesn't care, that, that he's not active in your life. You know, that's what, the, that's what the world tells us, and the enemy tells us in life, and James says, no, 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 God is very present in times of trouble, yeah. and very present in times of testing, and God walks with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. God. You know, I'm just interested that David, and this is just kind of off the side, this is why it takes me so long to get through anything, but we just bounce. But, but Psalm 23, that's almost everybody's favorite word, I guarantee you, people that don't even know the Lord somehow know Psalm 23. Yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, notice how David is talking about God. The Lord is my shepherd, that's about God. I shall not want. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You know, you, you restore my soul. And, and, then, and then David hits trouble. David, something happens to David. David is talking about God in the first couple of verses. God, you're wonderful. God, you lead me beside still water. God, you restore my soul. God, you nourish. And, and then all of a sudden, bam, a, a, a multi-shaded pirate hits David's life. And all of a sudden, David quits talking about God and starts talking to God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You know, and uh, David, David shows how life is with us, and that's what happens to us. We can talk about God, and we can, you know, we can we can uh, prophesy about God, and we can we can just bur uh, boast about God, and we can just uh, you know pontificate about God until something really hits us, and then all of a sudden, uh, we're not talking about Him; we're talking to Him because He's ever present in a time of need is what the Bible says to us. Well, how does that happen? It happens when we are affected by the Word of God to the point that the Word of God changes the way we live life. Yes. This is really the theme of James. The theme of James is that any kind of faith that is strong enough to save your soul is strong enough to affect the way you live, the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you involve yourself in other people's life, how you live life. And so if, if the faith you say you have hasn't changed the way you are, you are deceiving yourself. You don't have real faith. It's phony. It's false. It's fake. And when you stand before the Lord one day, it's going to be surprising. You're going to be part of that multitude that Jesus looks at and says, Depart from me, you worker of sin, for I never knew you. Never knew you. I'm just reminding you that he said, I never knew you. He didn't say, I knew you and you got away. Or I knew you and, and you did such bad stuff, I had to let you go. He said, I've never known you. You've never been real. I've never been in your life. And we can do that. We can fool ourselves. We can know a lot of things about God. We can, we can do a lot of good stuff and, 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 and think that that's right. We can come to church and study the Bible and believe in God. We can do all of those things. And, and James said, no, 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 no. It's not. It, 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 it's, you, you must trust him. You must believe him. You must have faith. But faith that doesn't change the way you are is, is, is phony faith. Yeah. It's not real. 
So if you want to know before you get to heaven, am I real? How many of you would like to know that? <laughs> You'd like to know before you stand before the Lord one day, am I going to hear, enter in my good and faithful servant? Or am I going to hear, depart from me, you worker of sin, for I never knew you? Which one would you like to hear? Well, I want to hear, enter in, my good and faithful servant. Yeah, enter into the joys of heaven. That's what I want to do. Well done, my good and faithful. Not half done, you know, not medium well, but well done, yeah. my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of heaven. That's what I want to hear. Well, in order to hear that, uh, I have to know whether I'm real or not. That'd be a good thing to know. And James says, okay. Let me tell you how this is going to happen. Let me tell you how you can know. God allows things to come into our life that test us, that affect us, that give our lives a chance to reflect things about ourselves. And when he, when he, allow, when he opens up the door and he allows these things to come into our life, these are not sinful things. These are not encouragements for us to sin. These are, in, these are opportunities for us to shine, uh, like, the, like, the, like the praise said a few minutes ago, to sh for our light to shine, for what he's put in us to, to, to show forth out there so that the world sees a life that reflects something that is amazing. And if you've ever run into anybody like this, this has been amazing to you to find out that even in some hardship and some terrible thing and something you're looking at and you'd go, my Lord, I don't know how they made it through that. And they're, they're making it. They're walking it. They seem to be cheerful. They seem to be up. They seem to be uh, faithful and expecting. And somehow you're going, where does that come from? James says, that's real faith. That's what that is. Yeah, yeah. When stuff happens in your life, it doesn't destroy you. It, it, it gives you an opportunity to become better, to become stronger, to become more uh, encouraged, to be bolder, to, be, to endure things. And it produces a, a work in your life that takes a green faith. Sometimes our faith is green and ripens it, matures it. How does that happen? It happens through these trials of life. So James says, Count it all joy when this happens to you because it's going to do something in you and you got to know that, you know. You got to know that. That's what you got to know. Yeah. All right, so you're not going to feel it. I'm, I'm telling you, and I know you're sitting out there going, oh, my Lord, I don't think I could do that. Yeah, I know because you're thinking about how you feel. You don't, um, you're not going to feel joyful. You're not going to feel strong. You're not going to feel faithful. That's why James doesn't say feeling this, <laughs> that the testing of your faith. You have to know something. And what is it you know? You know that God is going to walk with you through this, that it was a loving God who loves you and knows you and knows where you are that has allowed this pirate to slip through so that it could become an obstacle for you so that he could show you through you uh, a, a mighty strength in life. That's, you know, and, and you know this. You know this, knowing this. And so that's what James has been telling us. And then Let's look at verse 16, because that's where we stopped last week. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Uh, God gives only good things. Look at your neighbor and say, God gives good stuff. God gives only good stuff. Here, uh, you know, I want you to get this in your spirit and get it in your soul because this is what James is saying to us. This is what the Spirit of God is saying to you. When, 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 when bad stuff, when temptations to sin, which he's just talked about, about you being lured away like a, like a fish with a lure, you're, you, you, there is such a thing as temptation. And by the way, temptation is not sin. To be tempted is not to be a sinful person. Jesus was tempted. Jesus was taken out into the desert for the, for the exact purpose to be tempted. You remember this? 
for, for Jesus, you know, went, went out there for 40 days and, 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 and exposed himself to be tempted by the devil. So the fact that you're tempted doesn't make you a sinner. The fact that you're tempted is what happens in life. You're enticed by that, which is a weakness or a, an allurement or a lust or in your life that the enemy knows about, and he dangles it in front of you so that hopefully you'll bite the bait and, and, and he can drag you out, and you end up in a pot of scalding grease before it's all over with. That's what the enemy wants. But James says, don't make a mistake. God gives only good stuff. Now, it's not always pleasant stuff. Something doesn't have to be pleasant to be good, right? right. right. There are lots of things in life that aren't pleasant, but they work something good in you. So make no mistake about it. Write it on the wall of your bedroom or wherever you can see it. God gives only good stuff. That's what James says. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Above. And it comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness and no turning. In other words, there's not one degree of shadow in the things that God does. God doesn't, God's not fickled. God's not two-faced. God's not frustrated. God is not confused about anything, so there's not going to be one degree of shadow of turning in the fact that God gives only good stuff as opposed to sinful stuff. Maybe not pleasant, but it's good. And James says, you, you look, look, just get that in your spirit. Of, of, uh, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits. God did this. God brought us forth uh, so that we could uh, produce something that would be an evidence and we would be this sort of new creature, this sort of uh, king of the earth kind of a deal. We would be a, a first fruit. So when God birthed us, God planted something inside of us. Hey, I'm talking about in your spirit. You wonder why, no matter where people uh, inhabit the earth, and you've probably said it before in your life if you've ever heard of a new people somewhere being discovered, and you've heard them talk about, man, these people worship crocodiles or worship rocks, big statues, or these people have carved out images in these trees, or, or, or they worship the river itself, or what sun god, what, whatever it might be. You say, what is that all about? Well, it's all about the fact that every single one of us have been born with some light on the inside of us, that God puts light in us so that we understand that something is greater than us no matter, no matter who you are on the face of the earth, you're worshiping something that is greater than you. You understand that something is bigger than you. Now, you may not know what to call it, and you may call it the sun god or the moon god or the rock god or the crocodile or whatever it might be, but you're going to be worshiping something. James says, look, God brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be sort of a first. So God planted in us a... a, 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 a a fruit that he nurtures and he grows and he and, and it and it gets ripe and he he wants it to be exposed he he wants it to bear fruit look at your neighbor and say bear fruit <laughs> yeah i mean he planted it in you he has watered it with his word he has fed it with his word he's shown you the truth about his word you you are privileged to be part of a people that have heard the word that has an opportunity to respond to the word, who can be taught the word of truth. And so God has done that, and now he's looking for a crop to come forth. And that crop is fruit, to produce fruit out of your life. That's what God wants, and James says that's what God's expecting. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And I'm just calling to your memory that this is how you receive the word of God in suffering. When you're suffering and you say, God, I need your truth. God, I need you to speak to my heart. Uh, this, the, this is God's instruction about how to receive it. Receive it quickly. Every man be swift to hear. Swift to hear what? E everything? No. 
The world's full of all kinds of advice and information and instruction. Yeah, you know. This, they have all kind of answers to what kind of things you need to do. So it's not swift to hear anything. It's swift to hear the Word of God. That's what it means, swift to hear. Receive it quickly and quietly. Quit talking so much and listen. We love to hear ourselves talk. So we all want to be instructors. We all want to be uh, teachers. And James says, look, don't, don't, don't be striving for that. God needs a few people talking and a lot of people listening. And there are a lot of people talking who ought to be listening. And so spend your time listening and not talking about stuff. Uh, quit going to you know five Bible studies, go to one or two, hear the Word of God, and then start letting that affect your life. Spend the rest of the time living it out rather than trying to do something new and calmly and purely and meekly anyway. You, you, you got all that because I spoke it to you and, uh, you know, I know you remember everything I said, so you don't have to, you don't have to live that. So the Word of God is strong, uh, is a root that's been engrafted to you. Be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And he's just telling us, he's given us... Um, He's given us uh, comparisons, analogies, metaphors. He, he's, he's, he's telling us what, what the Word of God is, is like and how to receive. He says the Word of God is like a root that's a strong root and grafted. The Word of God is like a mirror that reflects itself. Why should I get in the Word? Why should I look at the Word? Because you need to see the, yourself the way you are. And James says it's the Word of God that tells you that. The Word of God tells you how you should be, how you should act, how you should receive, what should happen when you get in trouble, how you respond to the faith, how you bear fruit, how, you're, how you let your light shine. What is it that tells you how to be all that God created you to be? It's the Word of God. And he says, so when, when issues hit you, you know what the Word of God is like? A mirror that reflects the real you. It lets you see who you are and He's talking about in this passage, don't be like somebody who's a man in a hurry who walks by a, a, a terrible mirror and, and, and quickly forgets what he sees. You know, let the Word of God reflect in your light. And I talked about all that, so I'm going to move on. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a, and is not a forgetful hearer, hearer, but a doer of the Word. This one will be blessed in what he does. So the Word of God finally is like a perfect law that gives liberty. And this is what I was saying to you last week that... Uh, law is intended to bless us, not to uh, restrict us. Uh, I used one example of a month ago or so that there are some laws of music. You know this, right? I mean, there, there are laws of harmony. There are laws of rhythm, intonation, uh, those kind of things. Those are musical laws. And when we play music and hear music and do music, we obey the laws if we don't obey the laws, what happens? We become clanging cymbals and, and, and beating drums and, and lifeless, meaningless nothing. Thank the Lord that our praise team every week follows the laws of music. They don't just get up here and start banging and twanging and, 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 and saying stuff out and getting different you know, melodies and harmonies and rhythms and they're all messed up. It would be just a tremendous catastrophe. So the laws of music are intended to bless us with something beautiful, with something meaningful, with something that follows the law and it opens us to enjoy wonderful stuff. So we look into the perfect law of God, and it gives us uh, freedom. Not, it doesn't bind us. It gives us freedom. So James says, you know, when things start happening in your life, look into the perfect law of God, and it'll open up life for you. So James has a lot to say, doesn't he? It's amazing. All right, here comes, here comes something a little bit new. If anyone among you thinks that he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is vain. Vain, of course, obviously, I know you may know it means dead, lifeless, impotent. So your, your standards, your religion, your, your, your standards of thought toward eternity, toward God, uh, your theologies, your belief systems, James says, um, 
if you think you have one and it's going to get you to heaven and you can't control your tongue, your religion is dead, impotent, lifeless. How you talk, what you say. <laughs> oh, it's getting quiet in here now. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. It's because we're all sitting here going, oh, my goodness, what I say. Yeah. Yeah, James says, you, you know, it, it affects your tongue, what comes out of your mouth. I know I've heard people say, oh, I just say what I believe. Well, you better quit doing that. You know, quit being rude. Quit being, you know, reflective of something that is uh, immature yeah. and, and not helpful. You know, control that. Let that be, because James says, you know, if you're not able to do that, it's a reflection that the, what's in you is not real. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, just reflect this, and you already have this in your notes from before, but just to remind, remind you, these are four characteristics that we just heard in that verse. Number one, if that's real that's in you, you'll hold your tongue. I see we'll hold you tongue. All right. My proofreader didn't make it that day. <laughs> Number two, you will, you'll help the helpless, these people that are really helpless in life. You know, how do I know if my faith is real? Well, my faith is real. One of the things that reflects that my faith is real is that I genuinely care about people who are in need. Now, I'm not talking about these people that stand on the roadside with the sign, we'll work for food, and they will do anything but work for food. And if you try to get them to work, you say, hey, man, come on, let's go buy a hamburger, and I'll take you, and we'll do some work at the house. I need some wood loaded up, uh, and see how many of them will go with you. No, 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 no. They'll just basically walk away, because that's not, they're standing there, you know, they're, they're moochers, they're you know, that's their life. That's their livelihood. That's what they want. No, no. And see, so you, you have to use wisdom to discern truly needy people. When he says visit the orphans and the widows, he's talking about people that are genuinely in need. How do I treat those people? Do I care about what happens to them? And James is basically saying, how do you treat people that you don't need? It reflects my faith. If I, if I treat people that I feel like can help me, people that have money, people that have influence, people that can carry me to a higher level, can give me more resources, can give me more prestige because they elevate me and they give and, and um, I'm more influential because of them and I treat them properly and then I take the little person over here who has nothing and I treat them like dirt because they can't do anything for me that reflects that my faith is not real. It's phony. It's fake. One of the great things I like about Freedom River Church is I believe, I believe that we welcome everyone. The gospel is whosoever will, let him come. And so I, for, 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 uh, for this time, I feel like, man, that's, that's what this church is really all about. I hope none of you feel excluded or feel like somebody looks at you and says, man, you're, you're not really worthy of my time and my effort. I don't want to talk to you. I mean, it's a waste of time because you're nobody. How do you treat people that you don't need? That reflects your faith according to what James says. And then pursuing purity. Uh, that phrase was um, to... Um, to lay aside, to lay aside all evil. Lay aside means to pick it off like lint. Like Brother Charles, who's the most fastidious dresser that I've ever seen. <laughs> fastidious, for our definition, would be uh, picky. Uh, it would be uh, careful. Uh, he gets something on. I, I've seen Brother Charles for ten over 10 years, probably what, uh, closer to 13, 14 years more. I've seen him, uh, even if he comes to help on a work project up here and he's wearing some kind of a, you know, some kind of a sweatpants and some kind of a shirt that he would consider work clothes, he still looks like he just stepped out of a GQ magazine. <laughs> I mean, even his, even his work stuff is coordinated, you know I mean? Uh, 
And if something was soiled, it would be like, no, 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 we got to get rid of that. I, I can't even let that be seen because that's soiled and it's not a part of my life. And James says, like a fastidious dresser would quickly remove any garment that was stained, we're to look at our life like that and remove quickly anything that is wickedness or evil or, or, uh, or, or negative that people might, uh, that it might pollute our life. That's what James says. I mean, respond quickly like that. That's the way real faith faith responds. And then, and then that overflow of wickedness is a word superfluity that means um, it's, a, it's a word that is associated old, with old time medical expression, which means clean the wax out of your ears. So James is saying, you know what sin is in your life? It's like wax in your ears. And if you get it built up enough of it, it's going to hinder you from hearing what God says to you. So our responsibility as believers is to clear the old sin out of our life, to quickly remove the excess earwax so that we can hear the word of God. We're pursuing purity. That's what reflects that I know him. I mean, I know, look, I'm like you. My life at times... I. I'm not perfectly pursuing uh, purity in my life. Uh, I'm allowing things to bog me down and, 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 and keep me down. And I'm, I have it, thoughts and attitudes and, and, and things that are get in here and, and block and hinder things in life. But James is saying uh, that somebody with a real faith, that's not going to stay there. That's going to be fought against at all cautions. And then this last thing now, and we're going to go into this. This is what pretty much all of chapter 2 is about, and I'm going to just cover it quickly, so relax. I know, I know I'm seeing what time it is, so you're not, all right, I'm not going to just kill you. But notice uh, you are for, forgetting favoritism. Now, let me just talk to you about favoritism for just a second. We're, going to, we're about to read some verses. All of chapter 2 is about favoritism, really, every bit of it. Favoritism is an insult to God. Favoritism means, the word that is translated means according to the face. James says, if we make judgments according to the face, then we are evil people. Because we've set ourselves up as judges. Because if, if it's according to the face, it means we're making judgments about someone based on how they look. Which is an insult to the gospel because what's the truth about the gospel? The truth about the gospel is not let the pretty ones come to God or let the rich ones come to God. Or let the smart ones come to God. It is whosoever will let him come. And so God is not a respecter of persons. Jesus, when he was preaching at Cornelius' house, who Cornelius was a Gentile, it's in Acts 10 if you want to read about, about it. When Jesus was preaching to, at Cornelius' house, uh, it was basically saying that God is no, 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 it was Peter was preaching again. He said, God is no respecter of persons, which is true. God does not judge anyone according to the face. So if we want to reflect him, we cannot continue to favor certain people in life. And if we do that, it is a sure sign that we don't have real saving faith in life. It, it, it's, a, it's a drastic thing. And let me just show you how. I mean, you, I know we're all sitting here going, well, that's, you know, I got that. And you're thinking it's not so bad. You're thinking, well, okay, I understand that, and I'm not going to try to favor anyone, but, but we do. You know, I mean, we treat certain people certain ways, and we treat other people other ways. We treat some with respect, and we treat some with dishonor because we like some of them and we don't like others. Why do we do that? Because we judge according to the face. And if you like the face, then you're respectful and honorable and receptive. If you don't like the faith... You're dismissive and disrespectful and dishonoring. And I'm going to just show you, and I'm saying this to you because I know we don't think this is a big deal. But I want you to see what James says it is. Look, look, my brethren, 
Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Now, I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, so let me just tell you basically what that verse says. Just to give you a little paraphrase. That verse is saying that anybody who has the Lord of glory living on the inside of them cannot also have partiality living in them. In other words, if you say you have the Lord of glory in your life, the Lord of glory and a partial spirit cannot live in the same body. So don't say you're full of the Spirit of God and that Jesus lives on the inside of you if you are still making judgments according to the faith. Woo-hoo-hoo, yeah. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, uh, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So uh, in James's day, as an example, I'm going to tell you what this is saying to us. In James's day, um, uh, much like today, except we don't, I mean, we do it in a different way, but, but in James's day, it was not uncommon for people to rent gold jewelry and bright clothing. And the reason they would rent it is because they couldn't afford to own it. But that when they went out in public, they wanted to impress other people And so when they would go to the church or go to the temple, they would go and rent some some gold jewelry and and bright clothes so that when they walked into into the meeting, people would look at them and go, man, that's a prosperous person. Let come here, brother, come right down here and sit in this seat of honor. And and so they were faking it. They were not who they pretended to be. They pretended to be that so they could be accepted. And so what the church was doing by judging according to the face is they were encouraging people to be fake. We're going to receive you if you present yourself because we're so immature, we're still judging people by the way they look. And so that becomes the exact opposite of what the gospel is all about We're not encouraging people to be fakers. We're encouraging people to be themselves so they can be honest before God and honest before everybody. So if a congregation can't quit judging by the face, you are actually encouraging people to be something diametrically opposed to what God says that we are to be. So it's a reflection of our faith. So don't quit encouraging people to to be, fought, be fakers because you can't be mature enough to quit judging by the way people look. Whew. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? He's just reminding them of the, of the fact that rich people uh, have mistreated the kingdom in so many ways. I mean, he's trying to just present a case that there are lots of things to consider uh, about people who who you seem to want to honor in life. Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, everybody say God's law. The royal law is God's law. What is the royal law? Well, the royal law is the law of the king. If you want to live like a king, you have to live by the law of the king. And the royal law is... Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship anything that looks like a tree or a rock or whatever. Uh, You're to remember my day and keep it holy. Uh, I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers, the third, fourth generation. Obey your parents, you know, honor your father and your mother. Don't kill people. Don't lie about people. Don't want to break. And, and, it, and that was summed up by Jesus by this one little statement. Uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The royal laws are the laws God give us to, gives us to live in the kingdom. And so if you 
are part of the kingdom, you live by the rules of the kingdom and love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So here, here uh, if we're living by the royal law, and he's going to say this in just a moment, and we, uh, and the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself, but you are not loving your neighbor as yourself, you are loving certain people according to the face, then you're breaking the law. And it's a serious breakage of the law. Because if you break one, <laughs> you've broken the law. So if you break one law of not loving your neighbor as yourself, you've broken the law and become a transgressor of the law. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. I mean, look, do you see how serious this is? And I know you're all sitting there going, come on, man, let it go. Well, I mean, I would love to let it go, but I want you to see because James keeps talking about it. And he, we, he, do you see what he's saying? He's saying, look, this little insignificant thing that you have the tendency to just overlook and just fly by and just act as if it's nothing, it's just as important as not, in, not committing adultery and not killing people. That's what he's saying. He compares judging by the face to somebody who commits adultery and somebody who murders people. So he's saying this is a serious thing, man. Because if you do it, you're breaking the law just as surely as somebody who commits adultery and somebody who murders other people. Good night. You become a transgressor. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy tri triumphs over judgment. Now, let me just give you this one, this little thing real quick. Paul and James, according to many theologians and historians of the Bible and all these people that study this kind of stuff, uh, there has been a, a supposed disagreement between the Apostle Paul and James. Now, it, the disagreement, the supposed disagreement, is over what they taught about how you come to the Lord or how you are saved, how your soul is saved. Some say that the Apostle Paul teaches only that it is faith in God that saves your soul and, and, and nothing else but faith. Uh, Ephesians, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the Apostle Paul clearly is teaching that it is faith that saves your soul. Uh, that's great because God can see faith. Can you see faith? No, you can't see faith. You don't, I mean, somebody can say something with their mouth and, you know, you have to believe what they're saying. Basically, if somebody says that they're saved, that they've trusted Christ, then, hey, who am I to say they, they're not trusting Christ? And then James comes along, and James says that faith without works is dead. So the theologians and the historians and so forth have supposed that these two men are standing here face to face, one saying faith is what you're saved by, and the other one saying works are what you're saved by. And so there's this collision of am I saved by faith or saved by works? And I, I just want to give you a different reflection of that. Think of these two guys not as two men standing face to face opposing each other. Think of this as two soldiers standing back to back. Like we, used to, like we used to do, Lawrence, when we got in, in a fight with about five or six people. Yeah, I mean, there's two of us and five of them. 
How can we do that? Well, you, get, you put your back against my back, and I'll try to take care of everything coming from this direction and, and keep it off of you, and then you try to take care of everything coming from that direction, try to keep it off of me, and we're two soldiers fighting back to back against a common enemy. The common enemy is the perception of the world. The perception of the world is this. There are two real enemies of true salvation. Now listen to this, and I'll, I'll quit, okay? I'm going to quit. There are two enemies in this world that we face in, in, in an assault against salvation, and here they are. The first enemy is the concept that I can add to faith, I can add to uh, belief by doing good things, doing more good things, more good things means that I'm, I'm, I'm saved, and if I really want to be saved, I have to do good stuff. This is the belief that I can somehow work my way to heaven by doing good stuff. You see this all the time. You, you ask somebody, do you know the Lord? Are you going to heaven when you die? And what's their answer? I hope so. Or I think I, think I am. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to live a good life, Right? I mean, I'm going to church, I read my Bible sometimes, I try to pay my bills, I don't beat my children. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do good stuff. These are people that believe if you do a bunch of good stuff, you, you don't really need faith. And the Apostle Paul is saying that you are saved by faith through grace. The grace of God has given you the opportunity to be saved because you believe the right thing, not because you keep doing good stuff. That's not what saves your soul. You can do good stuff every day of your life until the rest of your life and never come to Christ. So the apostle Paul is sitting over here back to back with James saying, boom, it does matter what you believe. It's believing the right thing. Not just doing a bunch of stuff that gets you saved. And then James over here is fighting against the second enemy of salvation. And that is people who basically say, it doesn't matter what I do as long as I say that I'm a Christian. These are people that their lives never change. They, they, they look like, I mean, they're, they're just as wicked and just as deceitful and just as dishonest and, and, and reflective of no change in their life whatsoever. But if you ask them about, man, do you know the Lord? I, yeah, man, I prayed like five years ago. I went down to that altar and I said, Jesus, I believe in you and you come into my heart. And, and yet, you, and yet you, you, you believe that you can just say anything you want to say, and then that's good enough, and, and you, you know, there's, that's it in life. And James is saying, that's not good enough. James is saying, if you be really believe, there would be some evidence in your life by the way your life has changed that something is real on the inside of you. And so here, here they are basically defending each other. They're not fighting each other, one saying it's faith and the other one saying, no, it's work. They're basically brothers in the faith saying it does matter what you believe and it does matter how you act because if what you say you believe is not strong enough to affect the way you act, then what you say you believe is not the real thing. Because the real thing is strong enough to change the way you live your life. The way you act, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you treat other people. That's what the, that's the, so, so the supposed battle is only in the minds of the theologians and the historians. It's not real. And so that's what James is saying here. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he does not have works? Can, and I'm going to insert a couple of words because this is really what the verse says. Can, can that faith save him? In other words, if somebody says, uh, I have faith, but, you, but your life doesn't reflect it, can that weaky, pitiful kind of faith actually save somebody? That's what James is saying. Can that kind of faith save somebody? And, and, of course, that's a rhetorical question that demands the answer, no. No, that kind of faith can't save anybody. 
If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, now that might not mean totally naked. It might just mean they don't have enough clothes. I mean, they're, you know, they're not they're probably not totally, you know, buck naked walking around. They are. They probably have a little bit on, but they don't have enough. And it's just trying to show you that they're poor. And, you know, and notice that it doesn't say, I mean, when you, when you read that verse, you think about a beggar, right? Like a beggar out in the street, like somebody you'd come across. But notice what it says. It said, if a brother or sister. So James is not really talking about some beggar out in the street. He's talking about somebody you go to church with. Somebody that's like you who knows the Lord. I mean, so charity really does begin at home. It's what I'm saying to you. So if a brother or sister is naked and destitute, so we got people in need, truly in need, and man, they're suffering and struggling, and there are brothers and sisters, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm. Just, just a thought about this. Uh, the Jewish people to whom this was written, and this is a Jewish thought in, in what's said up here, depart in peace. Every uh, Jewish people end every conversation or interaction with shalom. When it, when it comes to an end and they want to dismiss the conversation and they're through talking and they're ready to move on, they say shalom, which means peace, peace. So what James is saying is, James is saying, all right, when, when, when someone is destitute, when they're in need and, and, and you see their need and they're a brother or sister and, and you basically uh, are in a conversation with them and before they even get through saying what they're saying, you basically say, shalom, and walk away. In other words, you have insulted them by not listening to what they had to say. You just, you've cut the conversation short it's like we would in our society, somebody's talking to us and we say, whatever, and then walk, you know. I mean, what is that? That's an insult. You're disrespecting somebody. You're not only saying, I don't care about you, you're insulting them. And so James is saying, okay, if you got somebody in your church and they're in need and they're talking to you about the need or about whatever, and you just say, all right, I've heard enough, yeah, shalom, but I'll go depart in peace, but, but, but you don't do, you don't give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? I mean, this is an illustration that James is saying, are you feeling what I'm saying? This also, thus also faith by itself does not have works, is dead. So in other words, you look at them and you just say, depart in peace and be warm, be full, even though you know that's not possible because it's, they're not even warm now, much less in the future. They're not even full now, much less in the future. But you, you, you have no compassion and no concern, and you've insulted them, and you just cut the conversation short because you don't want to have anything to do with them. You don't want to hear anymore because you don't plan to do anything. Just shut on my, uh, whatever. Uh, does that reflect somebody who really has Christ living in their heart? James says, no, no, no. See, that's that's something you say, but by what you do, what you have dead stuff on the inside of you, not live stuff, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. In other words, somebody stands up in the middle of the conversation and says, let me tell you this, I, have, I say I have faith and you say you have works. What difference does it make? That's basically what he's saying here. It's like somebody stands up and interrupts James and says, hey, brother, you know, it doesn't matter. You say faith, I say works, whatever. I mean, it just, you know, it doesn't really matter just so we, you know, have Christ. And, and James says, oh, yeah, it really matters. James says, what a horrible concept to think about. Yeah, it really does matter because what somebody says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, you, you have faith, but you don't have works. And then I say, well, I have works, but I don't have faith. In other words, I, whether you have Christ or not doesn't matter. That's what he's basically saying. He says it does matter because Jesus is the only way. <laughs> See, he's just basically saying, look, don't let somebody say to you that it doesn't matter whether Christ is involved in this because it surely does matter. You believe that there is one God. You do well, even the demons believe that and tremble. James is talking about the fact that these people that are saying these things are orthodox in their thinking. The, the one thing that makes Jewish belief system what it is, is they have a real strong belief that there's only one God. That's Jehovah God. They don't have a bunch of them, they, they have one. So James is saying, I'm talking to a bunch of orthodox people who believe the right thing, that there's only one God. But let me show you that even the demons believe that. 
Everywhere Jesus encountered the demons in the Bible, here's what the demons would say. The demons would basically look at Jesus and say, what do we have to do with you? You remember the demoniac of Gadara that confronted Jesus and the swine and the pigs and he put them in? What do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the God most high? The demon said that out of the, out of the person who was in the graveyard with all the clothes torn off and, and, and acting wild. The demons actually said it out. And James is just saying, look, just because you say that you believe there's one God, that doesn't make you special. Even demons say that. But they're not saved. They're not Christians. That's not anything to, that's going to elevate you. But do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And then it gives an illustration of Abraham. Uh, man, I, I wish I could, I could go on this. He, he, all right, can y'all hang with me one second? All right, come on, here we go. All right, the reason, all right, he's going to finish this, and you can kind of write this in your blank so you can go ahead and get ready to leave. I know you're chomping here. Uh, he uses an illustration at the end of two people in the Bible. One is Ahab and one is Rahab, R-A-H-A-M, Rahab the harlot. Every time you see Rahab, you also see the harlot. It's like, don't forget, she's the harlot. Um, the reason he chooses these two people is because every Jewish person would know about these two people without him having to explain it. Because Ahab, Abraham is the father of the faith, and everybody knows Father Abraham and believes that Abraham is the greatest person that ever lived on the face of the earth. And, um, and, and so uh, you don't have to explain how wonderful a Abraham is. And then Rahab is a, a harlot that uh, kept the spies from being killed. And so she's a great encouragement of somebody who came to the Lord and then showed how much she believed by protecting God's people from being wiped off the face of the earth. And she allowed them to come into Jericho and conquer the city by what she did. She did a mighty power. She reflected what she believed when she did what she did. Now, the two illustrations could be no further apart from each other to show the same thing. Abraham is a great patriarch and Rahab is a great prostitute. Okay, a lot of difference there, right? Uh, Abraham is a Jew and she's a Gentile. A lot of difference there, right? Abraham's a man, she's a woman, right? <laughs> okay, a lot of difference there. In other words, these two opposing illustrations are one extreme and another extreme. And so he says to, about Abraham, here's what he says about Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son at the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. All right, let me show you what that what is what that's saying in a nutshell. What it's saying is taking two incidences that happened in the life of Abraham, one that happened at the end of his life and one that happened at the first of his life, and he's, and he's, and he's, he's using both of those to say, to show us something. Now, he tells us about the one that happened at the end of his life first and the first of his life last, so it's kind of like this. And I, I, I don't think James would be upset if I flip it for us for just a second and just so you'll see what he's talking about. He's saying that... Um, God spoke to Abraham and, and when Abraham was a heathen in, in Babylon in Ur of the Chaldees and said, come on, I'm taking you to, to a better land and a great land. I'll make a great nation out of you. And, and Abraham said, where are we going? And God said, I'll let you know. Well, how long is it going to take us to get there? I'll let you know. Well, how will we know when we get there? I'll let you know. And Abraham followed God in spite of the fact that he didn't know where they were going, he didn't know how long it was going to take, and he didn't know how they would know when he got there. And the scripture says, because Abraham believed God, it was counted as righteousness. In other words, Abraham's belief said to God, I believe you and trust you. And God said, you're righteous, man. You're my friend. You're called the friend of God. So Abraham had a, a, a saving by faith because he believed God. So it was declared in heaven that Abraham was pure and righteous and true and holy because he believed God. But 40 years later, Abraham had a chance to prove that what was declared in heaven was lived out on earth when God said to him, take your son Isaac 
and take him up on a mountain and put a knife through his heart as a sacrifice to me. So that which was declared on earth, you're a believer, you're a friend of God, now has a test to see whether it's real or not. Because what was declared in heaven has to be lived out on earth. And so now Abraham takes his son Isaac, which I remind you was not only his son, but was also the promise from God. So God said, take the promise I made and kill the promise. And just to point out a a thought for us, there are times in our lives where we might be asked to sacrifice our Isaac on, on the altar, see? I mean, there, we, all have, we all have promises. We all have Isaacs, and God might, might ask us one day as a great test in life, all right, take, your, take the promise and sacrifice it on the altar. And so what did Abraham do? He took the stuff up on the mountain. He took his son on the mountain. You remember what Isaac said? My father, you have the knife. You have the fire. You have the, uh, the wood. But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham didn't look at him and say, you're the sacrifice. But he was. But Abraham just said, My, uh, God will provide the sacrifice. And so they lay, he lays him on the altar, and that knife is about ready to come down. And as he kind of begins to move down, God says, stop. Just wanted to see whether you were willing. So you see, that was the test. That was the works that proved that the belief was real. So that's what James said. James said, that's what I'm talking about. That if you have real faith, it's going to be proven and it's going to be tested and you're going to do what God tells you to do in spite of the fact that it doesn't make sense to you. Why would, it, why would God ask for the, the promise? I don't know. Why does God ask you for your promise? I mean, why does God kill the eyes in you sometimes? And then Rahab, Rahab, let me just read these verses. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Rahab was a Gentile woman. She was a prostitute. She was in the city of Jericho. Uh, uh, The children of Israel sent two spies into the city of Jericho. Not the 12 spies. They had already done that, and they had already decided they couldn't go in because they looked like grasshoppers, so they didn't make that mistake again. They didn't send send the two spies in to decide whether they could go in and take the land. They took the two spies in so they could say, what's the best way to do this? So the spies go in looking for the best way to conquer the city, and they encounter Rahab the harlot, which I'm assuming that most visitors to the city encountered the prostitute. Because the prostitute was interested in all these men that were coming into the city because that was her business. So she surely, you know, she encountered them first. And the king called her up and said, hey, there are two men that have come into the city. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, I want you to find out where they are and tell me because I need to kill them because they've come into the city to spy out the city. And it's dangerous for us. And Rahab said, okay. And, and she went back. And she talked to the two guys, the spies, and she said, I know your God is the greatest God that's ever lived on the, listed in the, in the universe, and, and I know he's powerful, and I know that he's going to conquer this land, and I know that, he, that, that we should all serve him and work. In other words, she declares her belief in the God of these two spies. So in other words, she makes a profession of her faith and says, I know this God's the greatest God, the biggest God, the most powerful God, and I want that God. So it was declared now that she had that God, that she trusted that God. She believed in that God. But it was made real when the king called her in and said, bring me the two spies or show me where they are. And she didn't do it. She said, hey, they must have went out the gate. And And so the king sent soldiers out the gate looking, but she had taken them on the top of the roof and hid them under some flax up there. And then when all the guards went out, she's told them, all right, go down by the back gate and let down back here and you'll be safe and then hide in the forest for like three days and you'll be safe. She protected them and she kept them safe and and, and kept them from being caught. And they went out and she said, hey, remember me now when God sends you into the city. And they said, take this scarlet thread and hang it out of the window of your house and everybody in your house will be saved. We won't kill them. So get your family, your brothers, sisters, mom, dad, anybody you want to be saved, bring them in the house with you and uh, hang this thread out and we won't do it. And that's exactly what happened when Israel came into the city, you know, march around the wall seven times, blow the horn, and the walls fall. And, 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 and there's one little thing standing and it's got a little scarlet thread hanging down out of it. And Joshua says, don't bother that. That right there is a believer. And uh, she lived just like, just like she was promised. 
and her family. Everybody was in the house with her. So see, the, the two examples are both the same thing. It's even though they're opposite extremes of life, Jew, Gentile, woman, man, patriarch, prostitute, uh, James is saying it doesn't matter which one of those you are or anywhere in between, that which is declared in heaven, which is faith, God can see faith. You can't see faith. You can only see what faith does. It was declared safe. All right, stand. Thank you.